It's Thursday, July 25th. I'm Matt Harmon. Welcome to the Yahoo Fantasy Forecast. It is truly, as it always is, but especially today, it's a hell of a day to talk ball. And joining me to do just that is Jory Epstein of Yahoo Sports, who is literally at Bears headquarters right now, Hallis Hall, recording this podcast. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see the background so that you know we are legitimate. Well, we, well, we are not legitimate. I am not legitimate. <laughs> Jory is legitimate. Jory, thank you for taking the time to do this with me today. What's going on? Matt, it's awesome to be on with you. Thank you so much. Are you sure that I don't just have montages of every part of Bears history on the walls of my own home in my hotel room? I don't know. But super excited to join y'all on my training camp tour right now. Started in Green Bay, now in Chicago. We'll hit quite a few places before we leave the Midwest. Um, And every time I get a little nugget, I'm like, oh, Matt's listeners would want to know because... You've got all the people engaged. I'm just like, let's talk about people. And you're like, I am going to help you win your fantasy league. So <laughs> to, together, we're going to crush it today. Together, we are going to crush it today. Uh, I, full disclaimer, do not say that I am going to help you crush your fantasy league. You, you, I'm just going to help you. I'm just going to be with you along the way. You all out mm. there are going to crush your fantasy leagues. Uh, we're just going to talk about it along the way. Okay. I, I, you are responsible for your own destiny. This is a podcast of personal accountability and personal responsibility. <laughs> so that is the way that this goes. So, all right. Listen, here's how this is going to go. Jory mentioned it. She's uh, she's at camps all over the place. Um, this is the time of a lot of news. I mean, I feel like every time I open my my Twitter app, my X app on the desktop, it's something new. Like I'm seeing a, a new training camp clip. I'm seeing a different GM head coach opinion. I mean, I saw my guy. I mean, he's not my guy, but I saw Chris Ballard hyping up my guy Josh Downs today saying he was so freaking good last year. I'm just inhaling that confirmation bias, Jory, because that's what new <laughs> that's what taking in the news really is. But you're here today to help us cut through some of the BS, honestly, because this is a show I like to do every year. We're going to call things like either a mini camp mirage or mm. a real training camp tea leaf here, because I don't know about you, Jory. I, I want your opinion on this, but. For me, when I'm following news cycles throughout the offseason, I like to kind of track that steady drumbeat, right? Like this is something that starts to percolate maybe early in the offseason. You really see kind of an early development of it once we get to mini camps and OTAs. And then really in training camp is when we start to get that momentum building into the season. Maybe even nobody really plays in preseason anymore, but maybe you see a player thriving in preseason. And so being able to stack that evidence, I think, is really important when we're trying to make these preseason predictions. I totally agree. And I mean, again, Even being at Bears today and tomorrow, it's like today they weren't in pads. Tomorrow, Caleb Williams will have his first pro padded practice. And so I feel like really every day, I know that we're not to September yet. We don't have games, but we are making specific and marked steps toward that point. Exactly. And that's how we, again, try to forecast things correctly here on the show as opposed to just like, wow, I saw this one guy make this sick uh, catch, you know, in a non padded practice and a one on one drill. Let's move them up three rounds of our fantasy draft boards. That's not how we do things around these parts. So let's waste no more time. Let's get into it. Um, let's start with some of the camps that you've been at re- uh, recently and kind of gotten the lay of the land. And before you went to Packers camp, uh, you did get to spend some time in Washington. So um, kind of what did you see there? What did you find out? Uh, and where are we standing with the team right now that you know, I, I people aren't super excited about the commanders, but I have like kind of a sick fascination with some of these offensive skill position players. So uh, especially my guy, Terry McLaurin. So where are we at with the commanders and what did you hear out of that camp? Yeah, I mean, I think you're totally right. Well, well first of all, I'll tell you, like, this sounds stupid, but the vibes there are great. And that is just not what the vibes have been in Washington for so long. And so by no means do I think that good vibes alone can win a football game, but I do think that bad vibes can lose a football game. So I think that for the first time, new ownership, new head coach, new general manager, new top tier quarterback in the draft and Jaden Daniels second overall, this is a team that just has a lot more reason to hope and a lot less mental baggage weighing them down. And so you look and it it was interesting. I mean, Jaden Daniels is definitely taking it step by step in terms of his Mm -hmm. progression on the field. But from a leadership standpoint, this is a guy who is showing up to the building 530, 545 every day. This is something he did at LSU coming in really early. And his teammates, I mean, these got these vets are saying like, hey, I thought I was the first one in the building. What's this kid doing here? What's this guy doing here? Oh, he's already, it's seven o'clock and he's already gone through his walk through in the bubble and lifted and had a film session and eaten breakfast, which again, I am not a morning person, so you will never catch me with those four things. I'm more likely have done all that by 3 a.m. than be awake by 7 a.m. Oh. But I think that you really got to see that Jaden Daniels is just 
doing everything the right way, which is important if you're going to be in this new offense. He'll be in this Cliff Kingsbury offense. They've got a ton of different offensive minds in the building, like Brian Johnson is in there. Anthony Lynn is in there. Obviously, Dan Quinn is overseeing primarily the defense, although he's the head coach of the team, so really everything. Um, And I think that when you look at the skill positions, they're going to have the quarterback who can make it work at some point, I would think. The question Mm -hmm. is, what's it going to look like in 2024? Because I think 2025, the commanders should be a solid team. I'm just not sure how quickly it's going to come to them. What do you think? Yeah, uh, first of all, I think after the show is over, you and, you and I need to have a serious conversation about your um, sleep habits. OK, uh, so that, yeah. that's but we'll put that on the back burner for a second there. Being up at 3 a.m. And, and not being a morning person, we, we can't have that, Jory. But <laughs> on the main topic here, which is Washington, my I family think you, will thank you for that. But continue. Well, absolutely. I'm here to help. Uh, I'm here to help with that much more than helping people win their fantasy leagues. I'll tell you what. But uh, I think you bring up an interesting point when you talk about the uh, coaching staff here for this Washington uh, commanders group, because. I don't want to say this is necessarily a bad thing, um, but it does strike me a little bit like the Panthers coaching staff last yes, year. Um, a because, thousand percent. And I'm glad that you find that too, because I hadn't really connected those dots until we just started talking about it here, that it is on its surface an interesting group of people from a lot of diverse offensive backgrounds. Like what Anthony Lynn has done is like a kind of conservative run game coordinator uh, and then really like even back in his days with the head coaches of Los Angeles Chargers, which is why Eckler's there. I think a big part of that very different than what Cliff Kingsbury did, even from a run game perspective in Arizona. Um, Brian Johnson with the Philadelphia Eagles last year, that was a very kind of static offense that I think needed a little bit. I also more don't season. think it was his offense that he was running. And that's a whole other thing that we could have a conversation so, about. That's a, a great point. I, I said this a lot, too, with uh, that Eagles offense last year that I'm a big Shane Steichen fan, but that offense looked a lot like Shane Steichen's offense. And then we're all criticizing how it's no, the, not the middle of the field. You know, it's too stacked. And all that it was like they just had a different guy pull, pushing the buttons last year. And then when that guy's out of the room, I think it puts more pressure on people to elevate into positions that maybe they're not the most comfortable. But again, I do think that's going to be interesting to watch how all of that kind of comes together for Washington, because, you know, just when you do, I'm working on my league wide projections right now to hopefully write a piece for Yahoo next week. And just again, kind of put together preseason rankings. When you look back at like play calling data of Cliff Kingsbury and some of these guys, it is, it could potentially be a very interesting offense even this year. But I do think like all of these ideas coming together, the fact that you've got a rookie quarterback, the fact that you've got some new players in the building, it could definitely be an operation that takes a little bit of time. Yeah, I think so too. And again, like I like the guys that I'll have in the room. I like that he's got Terry McLaurin and Jahan Dotson as options. I like that. I don't think Zach Ertz is going to be like the guy, but I like that he'll be mentoring Ben Sinnott and there should be like mm-hmm. some degree of continuity over time. And similarly, you got Austin Eckler as Brian Robinson. I also think that Austin Eckler will be really interesting in special teams with all the new returns. I think that's definitely something mm-hmm. Dan Quinn sees as a great role for him. Um, but yeah, I'll have to see how quickly does Cliff want to throw everything at Jaden because What struck me is that when I was in Washington, they kept talking about making it easy for the quarterback, trying to take responsibilities off their plate, trying to make it a quarterback-friendly system. And then I go to Green Bay this week, and you have Matt LaFleur saying, hey, I used to try and bring a quarterback along slowly, and now I decided I should throw everything at him and let him learn by mistakes, learn by failing, but I'd rather him learn that way than not understand something conceptually from the beginning. And I asked him when he changed that philosophy, and he said with Jordan Love, and so that was a very different tone than I heard in Washington. And I don't think there's one right way for a single team. I don't think, I think every team is different. I think every quarterback is different, but I think they'll have to see how much they let Jaden Daniels do what they fully envision his role as being from the start. I want to transition to the Packers, but just to put a bow on the Washington conversation from like a brass tax perspective here, their week one game. And it, it, by the way, it, it almost just excites me a little bit to be looking at the week one schedule and be like, this is, this is coming. Yeah, you've got this that giddy little smile for those who are listening and not watching. <laughs> this is this is exciting. Uh, week one in Tampa Bay uh, against a you know hardened defensive mind in Todd Bowles. We know they throw a lot at young quarterbacks. You know he could just be blitzing the hell out of Jaden Daniels in week one. Um, they they play New York at home. Giants front four looks pretty ferocious after adding Brian Burns to go along with Lawrence and Thibodeau. Um, so yeah, I think our kind of consensus here, Jory, is. 
maybe by the end of the season, even, you know, after their, which is a super late week 14 by maybe this offense is starting to come together. But if you have commanders players on your fantasy team and like it takes a little bit of time for the results to start trickling in, don't be surprised. But yep. since you brought up Jordan Love, and I think that's a super interesting point, he's obviously he is he's a central figure right now uh, because the contract situation, and all that. Um, so just kind of go through some of what you heard about Jordan Love and just I, I love Matt LaFleur's perspective on quarterback development and how that's changed a little bit. Yeah, so I spent two days at Green Bay this week and I was actually pretty shocked that right as I was landing in Appleton, Wisconsin, I'm seeing this press conference from general manager Brian Gunakus and he's saying, we don't have a decision to make on who our franchise quarterback is. Our franchise quarterback is Jordan Love. The question is now, what are we going to pay him? How are we going to come to a contract negotiation agreement? And I was shocked because he started for one year. Mm -hmm. I understand he's been in the building for four years. I am not one to question the Packers' ability to make a decision on quarterback. Generally, I think the guys we're interviewing know football way better than I do. I especially think that when they are the Packers and they've somehow gone from Brett Favre to Aaron Rodgers to Jordan Love's first season without a drop-off when usually it's super hard to replace someone who's like of that legendary, like surefire Hall of Fame status. Um even so, it's one year of a sample size. I texted a quarterback agent who's got some pretty high-profile clients, not Jordan Love this week, and I asked if he was surprised. And the, the agent said, yeah, I always think philosophically you need two years before you can really crown a quarterback because the first year you never know if – Defenses just didn't have time to game plan for them, to prepare for them. Once someone has a whole offseason and throws new things at them, I need to see how the quarterback responds to that before I'm willing to crown that. All that said, the Packers are crowning Jordan Love. Like, I don't think that's a question here. I think that I don't know if the deal's going to be done in a week or in four weeks or what it'll end up looking like. But even if they don't get a deal done before the season, they believe he's their guy moving forward. And they feel like what they saw the three years before he started – I was really going to tell. I thought it was fascinating that uh, Matt LaFleur, when I was talking to him, and I was kind of asking about just Jordan's development over the course of last season, really pointed to their game against the Steelers, which they yep. didn't actually win, but they were competitive. And Jordan Love had this one touchdown to Jaden Reed. I think it was like 35 yards. And um, it was a pretty impressive throw, like right over the hands of two Steelers defenders. And it was something where Jordan had to drop back, drop back a little more, and he just stayed super calm. And LaFleur said he kind of realized that game like, hey, I've been protecting these guys in a way that I don't need to protect them. It wasn't just Jordan Love. It was the quarterback. It was young receivers, young tight ends, a lot of youth on that team in the post-Aaron Rodgers era. And because of that, he was being very conservative with his play calling. Only then, after Jordan made that throw and started making throws like that in the Pittsburgh Steelers game, did Matt LaFleur say, hey, you know, what? I should be more aggressive. I understand what play calls are going to work for Jordan. I understand where we're going. And after that, they obviously won a ton of games and also went on to win a playoff game and play really competitively against San Francisco. And so I think on one hand, you have this contract holdout where, as Brian Gunacus, their GM, told me, every single day that Jordan's not there gets more and more costly. And he, they expect him out there. They want him out there. He is in the building. He's holding in, not out. So mm -hmm. he's engaged in meetings and he's kind of watching practices, but he isn't practicing and he needs to get the chemistry and the timing with those guys to be ready for the defensive coordinators. But assuming he gets back in some sort of reasonable fashion, I am so excited to see what Matt LaFleur can do from a play calling standpoint. Now that he's had a whole off season to be like, I trust this quarterback. I understand this quarterback. Now let's roll. Yeah. One, I think the contract gets done and, and it's not something I'm going to stress about. Like maybe in two weeks, if it's not done on, on this podcast, I'll be singing a different tune. But I'm with you that I think eventually just, he's just, it's going to get done. It will happen. And like, I'm so glad you brought up that Steelers game, Jory, because like if people listen to this podcast last year, they know I was saying the exact same thing, which was th they didn't win that game. Like on paper, statistically, it doesn't look anything special. 52.5% completion rate, two touchdowns, two picks, 71.8 passer rating. People look at that on paper. It's like, man, this, this, this guy's struggling. It's, it's not happening. But I think that's the thing that one of the reasons I'm okay, even after just one year's worth of data, thinking that Jordan Love is that guy, and like me personally, I'm I'm ready to crown Jordan Love because I think even before the results and the stats caught up, I think when you actually watched him play, you saw some really really good things. And you know, I've talked a lot about Christian Watson and kind of how they were, I think, putting too much on his plate at mm. times last year. I think they wanted him to take a second year leap into being like a big true time true like number one outside receiver. When I don't really think that's his game, you know, it took him kind of getting injured. But when Jaden Reed got more involved, when Dontavian Wicks got more involved, they started spreading things out a little more. That's when the results and the stats caught up for Jordan Love. But I think he was showing signs of being that guy all the way through. And the second part of it is that, yeah, it was a, it was a good first year starting. But like 
if you look at just the overall like efficiency stats, fifth in EPA per drop back, 13th in success rate. Like it wasn't just like, oh yeah, he played he played pretty well. It was just a, a really exceptional quarterback year. And the final point, and this comes back to all those skill position players, Jory. Again, I think the context of it being one year's worth of data is is important here. It wasn't as if he had a bunch of vets there to lean on, right? Like these are mm. all young pu- like he was the vet in in yeah. in terms of experience in the league. He was like the old guy there and this was his first year starting. So, I think that's probably another layer as to why Matt LaFleur is like, "Okay, probably sharing the same sentiment that you said and I feel the same way, which is like this should be the year we're not do- no patience, none of that. Like this should be the year this offense is set up to go." Right. LaFleur talked about how you want your quarterback to be an extension of the coaching staff in the huddle, someone who understands what you need to do, why you need to do it, the intent of the play, the protections, which again, that's something that not every team is asking their quarterback to do. And I had center Josh Myers, I had running back Josh Jacobs, all these different guys. I know Josh didn't play with him last year. Mm -hmm. Talk about from last year's season and into OTAs, the ways that he's flipping protections, the ways that that he is able to protect himself not only by getting out of the pocket or throwing the ball away, but also by reading the defense, understanding what he needs to do, and reacting in in time. And uh, Sean Clifford, their backup quarterback, actually told me a story where there's a third down play that they had in the red zone. And Jordan, I don't know if he misheard it from Matt LaFleur, but whatever it was, there was a miscommunication on the play. And it was not supposed to be a play that they run in the red zone. And Jordan didn't blink. Mm. He threw the touchdown. And it was kind of this moment where they're like, okay, you know what? It doesn't need to be the perfect play for Jordan to be confident in it. He'll make it the perfect play or he'll make it a successful play at least. And he'll be able to read and react. And I just remember when Aaron Rodgers went on, I'm guessing it was the Pat McAfee show last year, and talked about this idea of of quarterbacking. And he was talking about Dak Prescott at the time, but he said he loved the way that Dak was playing the game because he feels like so many quarterbacks play the game as an athlete now or as a passer Hmm. and not as a quarterback with everything they're doing, both pre-snap and post-snap at the line of scrimmage. And that was what kept coming back into my mind when I was talking to Matt LaFleur, when I was talking to Jordan's teammates and I was talking to Goody about the different things that Jordan was doing mentally, which again, first year starter, fourth year vet, he was playing a lot more like the fourth year vet that he was. That's such a, an interesting kind of juxtaposition because I've been thinking about this a lot with the quarterback position where there are these guys like Rodgers is a great example. Big Ben was a good example before he retired that kind of were a little bit, this sounds harsh, but like stuck in the past at the quarterback position, kind of that like, and mm-hmm. I, I think I've talked about like Joe Burrow being a little bit guilty of this, although I think maybe part of his reasoning is I got pounded earlier in my career. I I just want to be able to like (laughs) sit back and identify matchups and everything. But yeah, that typical old like field general type of um, type of way of playing the position, whereas then you have kind of these younger guys who are being like uh, maybe catered to a little bit more like these systems that are so set up to take that pre snap work off of their plate. But it also brings you sort of these quarterback advantages like play action, turn your back to the defense under center, you know, these full speed at the snap motion, all that stuff. The I think the best quarterbacks in the league are the guys who can meet somewhere in the middle. I think Mahomes yeah. is that way. I think Josh Allen has developed into that way rather quietly. I think CJ Stroud as a rookie showed that he could be that guy. But I think Jordan Love belongs in that group, too, based on you telling that story like another piece of evidence. So, again, this is an offense that we expect to be really, really good. It would be a, a mistake, though, Jory, to, to leave this conversation about Green Bay, where we're, yeah, we're excited about the quarterback. We're excited about the whole ecosystem. Is there any sense coming out of the building as to like who is the guy in the receiver room or in the running back room? Because I, I can see a lot of different ways that this play out, this plays out just based on you know, a variety of factors. But um, I know that might not be a clean answer. So don't feel pressure to give me like something if you don't have it. Yeah, so I think it's worth noting that not only was I there for two days with no, there was no pads, there was no Jordan Love, and the first day there was this torrential downpour where it rained for over an hour, and Christian Watson probably dropped every pass, not every pass, pretty close to every pass. But I'm not saying that Christian Watson can't catch. I'm saying that like the balls were soaking wet, job the centers being like I think I have trench foot. Like it was like pretty intense. Shout out to them for staying outside, but yeah, there was a little bit of that. Every single person will tell you we don't have a one. We can all be a one on any given day. I think what's interesting in this is, look, I was with the Cowboys in 2018. They drafted Michael Gallup in third round, who, by the way, retired. Fantastic human. One of my favorite, favorite, like just sweetest guys in the league. That said, they were like, well, yeah, just come in and be basically a receiver one as a third round rookie. And it didn't work out. So I've seen what it looks like when receiver by committee fails. I don't know that that's exactly what I feel like is going on in Green Bay because these are 
that's kind of what they tried to do last year. And now you have a bunch of guys who did show they could do things at different moment, who the coaching staff understands what they did last year. Like they're not trying to learn on the fly this year. Um, it'll be interesting to see what Josh Jacobs can do. I do think he's healthier than last year. I also think that his yards per carry obviously slipped last year. And so I don't think he's going to get the same number of opportunities that he got in Las Vegas. But I do think that if Jordan Love is airing it out, which I would expect him to do, that'll open some things up for Josh Jacobs. I also will tell you that Matt LaFleur is super excited about A.J. Dillon. I know mm. that uh, I'm not saying like draft him first in your fantasy league, but he just came <laughs> back super ripped. It was kind of funny where like Matt LaFleur was like, he came back in the best shape that I've ever seen. And we were like, what? And he's like, just for a guy that big to have abs like that, like you don't see that very often. And I was asking Josh about that, Jacobs, and he was like, I mean, I noticed it, but I wasn't going to say anything. That'd be weird. And he was like, he must have changed up his diet. And I was like, did you ask what he's eating? He's like, no, 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 that'd be weird if I asked. But everyone is noticing that A.J. Dillon physically is not where he was a year ago. So take take for that what you will. No, that's a really good nugget because I think like right now, fantasy, like the hive mind assumes that this is this could develop into a committee between Josh Jacobs and rookie Marshawn Lloyd. Uh, that's like people are people are excited about Marshawn Lloyd as a late round draft pick uh, because, look, anytime you can tether a backup running back to an, an offense with this type of upside, I mean, that's a really good pick. Obviously, people are taking Josh Jacobs in the early rounds. But again, there's that idea that it could be a two man committee. If this thing becomes a three man committee and AJ Dillon and his abs gets mixed in here. That's a really me- four like, man committee and, and one for the abs. One for yeah. six for the abs. I mean, it depends abs. on okay, what done, the pack, the, the, the like what exactly. six pack, eight pack. I don't know what's going on there, but I mean, I'm not going to ask either. Josh Jacobs not asking. I'm not asking. <laughs> I guess like that, that's that that's that situation. But if we can, if like a third man makes his way into this committee, like again, I'm doing projections right now. That's going to be a mess. So that's a really good thing, like to ha- have in the back of your mind. Like, let's see if that does develop throughout the course of the season. And I'll give you one more little nugget, which is that not only should you be worried about the running backs if you're trying to just have a guy who's going to go off, but in addition to this crowded above average receiver room, even if there's no like Devonte Adams in there, when Josh Jacobs um, was signed by the Packers in free agency. He said he was a big fan of Jordan Love and just amazed what he did last year. And I was like, how much did you watch what he did last year? And he was like, well, I remember the film when we were preparing for them. I was like, wait, stop. Like, you're a running back. He's a quarterback. Whenever we ask quarterbacks going against each other, they're like, I'm not going against the offense. Why were you watching Jordan Love film? And there was a play with Jordan Love week one versus Chicago last year where he rolls out to his left, I believe it was, and kind of like throws this like almost like back shoulder, like not back shoulder, he throws this fadeaway pass Mm -hmm. to Aaron Jones in the backfield. And Aaron Jones just goes upfield for like 50 something yards. And Josh Jacobs watched that on film because the entire Raiders team had that clip playing before they played the Packers um, and was just like, whoa, look what that quarterback could do. Like, I didn't realize Jordan Love had that in him. And I think it was interesting because he's telling me this now. He still remembers the play so deeply. And that was something Aaron Jones did last year. So I will be interesting to see to what degree Josh Jacobs is kind of in that role also of, hey, True. it's kind of a pass, it's kind of a run, but there's a little bit of a mix here. Yeah, he he can absolutely get involved as a receiver, even if he's never been like a highly targeted player. Um, this was from Matt LaFleur yesterday. Uh, Coach Speak Index account on Twitter uh, posted this. I'm going to probably cite them a, a lot leading up to the year. But uh, Matt LaFleur said, quote, I think the beauty of our wide receiver room was you just never know who's who who's that going to be like each and every week. It seems like a new guy's a focal point, and I think that just gives us a lot of flexibility on offense and keeps defenses a little bit more on their heels. That sounds like a room that's going to be really hard to predict, but I think, again, we'll get more and more clues on that throughout the course of the offseason. Let's transition to another NFC North team, the team you're with right now, the Chicago Bears. Um, I know you got a chance to watch a lot of practice today. Um what's the vibe talk about talk about a vibe like what's the vibe going on there it feels like it should be all good things in Chicago right now yeah I actually love that not only do they have a really high ceiling at offense but they should have a high floor if not also high ceiling on defense like this Mm. defense is ahead of the offense we can say that that's okay that makes sense. This is a defense that had a lot of guys who have already been together. They've been in the scheme. They've been under Matt Eberflus versus an offense that has Shane Waldron coming over as the offensive coordinator from Seattle. Caleb Williams knew at quarterback. Roma Dunze knew. You got Keenan Allen coming over via free agency. There are so many moving parts in addition to the guys who have already been here. But I think that I will say, I mean, look, 
Caleb Williams is obviously exciting people. He's obviously got the talent, the arm angles. There's one drill today that they were doing that was like pretty straightforward, but kind of amazed me the fluidity that that Caleb had, where it's kind of like you're you're doing a handoff and then immediately you're having to catch a pass and throw it. But it was just hmm. like the way he transitioned. You're basically doing two separate plays in the same drill. And to him, it was just like, okay, yeah, like this is what's going on. Um, he definitely was scrambling a lot during team drills. Sometimes it was more effective than others. Um, and I would say he seemed to be going toward Roma Dunze a lot in team drills. Again, this is their last non-padded practice tomorrow. We'll know even more with the pads. Um, but I did talk to Rome after practice today, and we were kind of talking about, look, they had a couple of short passes that went well um, and come back that went well as also, when he wasn't actually the first read of the play, but Caleb came back to him and they found it, Interesting. they're still working on their go ball. Uh, Rum told me earlier this week they had some successful go balls, but today they were kind of not on the same page of back shoulder over the top, what they needed to do. And it was interesting. Rome was also talking to me about how he has to factor in how big of a stride he has um, when, in terms of the separation he's getting and in terms of how much the quarterback's dropping back. So I was like, if it's like – six steps for the receiver do you have to go four like do you have to change the math and he's like no it's not quite that far yet but it is something they're working on and so to me I always say and I said this when Jaden Daniels didn't make every pass when I was there in June if they're completing everything now that's a problem because it means either one they're not trying hard enough Hmm. or two like they're just sort of like adjusting for the result rather than going for the process and so I think that they are learning they're having a defense who's coming after them who's stingy who's feisty um and I think that they're they're seeing growth and I think that they'll see play in the preseason games, but they're not there yet. This is a great reminder, uh, like that entire breakdown you just gave, that this is practice. Like sometimes practice is just to try, right? Um, Yeah. I I have been tagged seemingly in about 100 tweets about the Bills receivers today. Like, and people are (laughs) texting me these and like messaging me these. It's not just even being tagged on social media um, because Keon Coleman's been getting a lot of work in the slot today where the other day or yesterday he was outside. Um, And then, you know, they're putting Curtis Samuel like in a bunch of motion. They're doing all kinds of different things that the practice before they weren't doing. Right. Whereas like Matt Collins the day before is taking all the X receiver snaps and or or Keon was. And like, so there's a lot of alternating here. And again, they're t- these teams are trying to figure it out right now, especially a new team. That's just like a, a different example where they're breaking a new receiver room. This example in Chicago, you're right, literally is everything is new. Like DJ Moore was on the team last year, but he's never played with Caleb Williams before. None of these guys have played in this offense. So it's I do think that this is a team that Again, like if you look at fantasy rankings and ADP and stuff like that, there seems to be like a degree of certainty as to how like the receiver hierarchy is going to play out or how the running back hierarchy is going to play out. But it's also a team that I, I would almost be willing to believe anything. Um, like even the fact that you tell me like he's Caleb Williams is looking for Roma Dunze, that doesn't surprise me because one, those guys were clearly tight, and two, Roma Dunze is really freaking good. Like, I mean, you know, I was super high on him as a prospect. Like, I wouldn't be surprised if, yeah, he's going to be the third receiver drafted on this team, but he could easily be, and I, I know this sounds aggressive because Keenan Allen's really good and DJ Moore's really good, and he's a rookie. Maybe it's not the most likely um, in the range of outcomes, like most likely outcome, but I do think it's a possible outcome that he's just the most productive receiver on this team year one. And the other thing I love is that, when you think of Caleb Williams, what type of play do you think of? You think of those off script plays. You think of throwing outside of structure, being able to create extend plays. When I was talking to offensive coordinator Shane Waldron today about what really stood out to them from Roma Dunze, obviously he's productive, obviously he's successful, but I'm like, explain to me why. And one of the things they said was that when Michael Penix was going out of structure, when he was extending the plays and, and getting creative, Rome was the one downfield adjusting mm-hmm. and ready to be there, even if it wasn't what the play had called for. And so I think that, to me, that's probably what I'll end up writing tomorrow, which is that this isn't just a Caleb can go outside the pocket. It's a, hey, Caleb goes outside the pocket. Rome understands what to do because they both kind of have those instinctual backgrounds. Then you pair it together and it can be a nightmare for defenses. Now, all that said, the Bears do want to work on Caleb's pocket presence. They do want sure. to make sure that in addition to those out-of-pocket plays when he's extending that he's able to create from the pocket. Um, but I do think that that, to me, I was just kind of picturing what they can do. And again, high ceiling. It sounds like they actually kind of want to put a lot on his shoulders very quickly uh, in Chicago. And and he's a guy that should be able to handle it, number one. Um, kind of different from what we talked about with Jaden Daniels. Like the first yes. couple weeks of... Uh, yeah, so that that is a difference, one. But even like two... You look at the early season schedule for uh, the for the Bears. It's a little bit 
and look, er, forecasting defensive strength can be a fool's errand in the preseason. I get that. But, you know, the Titans in week one, the Texans is probably a tough game going to Houston in week two, but the Colts in week three, uh, the Rams, their defense is in transition in week four. Like there are some spots for this Bears offense to kind of hit the ground rolling if they are truly ready to throw Caleb Williams out there. And I, I found that interesting that you think there is a difference between the way these two teams are operating. I'll give you two comparisons. One, on the notion of the difference between Jaden Daniels and how Washington is approaching him compared with Caleb Williams and the Bears, it has been months since I was in Washington. We now are about a week away from the first preseason game for the Bears because they're playing in the Hall of Fame game. The Bears are like, yeah, Caleb's our quarterback. He's our guy. That doesn't mean he won't learn, but like he is the number one guy and the leader. And then you have Washington, and I do think Jaden Daniels will be the week one starter, Mm -hmm. but Dan Quinn is very intentional that he doesn't want to name him that too early. Now, he did say, okay, uh, Marcus Mariota got more first-team snaps at the beginning of minicamp and OTAs. Then you went on to the later part of OTAs and minicamp, and Jaden Daniels is getting more first-team snaps. That was intentional. It was earned and intentional that he was going to kind of build into that. So I think they are working toward that. But the degree to which they are willing to crown their leader and the timing of that, very different. Now, the second thing I want to contrast is you're talking about that Chicago schedule and why the Bears might feel even a little more comfortable putting Caleb Williams out there, which, by the way, does not mean he's going to be perfect. And that was one of the things I'm working on this story about like when a rookie quarterback is ready to start and a big thing that I keep hearing from head coaches and GMs is you have to make sure that they're resilient enough that when they fail because they all will fail it's just a matter of how and how much they're able to rebound from it and they're able to to see what they can learn from it that said Caleb's starting schedule in that beginning of the season is so different than can you guess who starts off the season going against the Bengals, then the Seahawks, then the Jets, then the 49ers, then the <sighs> Dolphins, then the Texans? It's the it's the Vikings, right? It's the Patriots. Oh, the Patriots. Oh, and I'm geez. like, okay, please put Jacoby Brissett out for that. Like, yeah. do not make Drake May start off for that schedule. It's just not worth it. It's just not. Yeah, jo- Jory, I'm um, here blowing up my spot. I'm not as prepared <laughs> with the week one schedules as, I, as I'd like to be. I'm but. not. I'm not either, but... But that no, was it, one that I just like can't get out of my head, the Patriots starting schedule, because they are the ones who I think should not start their rookie quarterback from the beginning of the season. And if you didn't need just like the general readiness and relative readiness compared to Jacoby Brissett, look at the schedule and we should have a settled question there. Yeah. And I, I can't wait to read that piece because I am typically like, just start the rookie. Like, let's go. Who cares? But um, I'm definitely ready to be challenged by that. Okay, I have one last thing, and then we can move on with your your scheduled programming, which is that to me, I had a lot of conversations in Green Bay about patience, and patience particularly at the quarterback position. And I asked them, is it more of a philosophy or just like circumstantial that they keep having guys like Aaron and Jordan sit for at least three years before they actually play? It's both. When you have an MVP candidate in the room, you don't need to start your next quarterback. But another thing is they mentioned this franchise support of like a personality of patience in Green Bay. And it was fascinating to me because obviously Green Bay is the only team without like a team owner because they have more mm. of a public ownership structure. And like I can't picture David Tepper being like, yeah, give Bryce Young three years and then we'll see what happens. <laughs> and right. I'm not saying Chicago should do that. Again, I'm here right now. I think Caleb Williams should start. But I am curious if you think Green Bay has this unique advantage not having to answer to one owner right away, particularly with the way they're managing their quarterback room. If the way they handled their quarterback room and honestly – like to bring it back to the entire offense, if the way they handled that is any indication, then yes, because it wasn't just like, hey, we have a quarterback who we've taken forever to get on the field. They threw that guy out there with like a bunch of rookies. I wonder if uh, rookies yeah. and second year players, I wonder if there is a team owner like who comes down, if, if hypothetically Green Bay comes down is like, um, no, like let's. I want a name. I want somebody that this young kid can count on, and all that. And um, it was definitely an operation of patience too, from the coaching staff perspective. And you know, there's a really good nugget by you to say like that. Matt Lafleur eventually got to a point where he's like, "Oh, I don't. I can like hold back on these guys." I think there were plenty of moments early last year where he's like white knuckling at the podium, like. Oh, I've got some pretty good plays called, but these guys can't get to the right route depth, but I don't want to throw my players under. And he did a really good job not throwing his players under the bus. Yeah. I think a lot of coaches would have gone up there and been like, well, yeah, if, you know, Dontavian Wicks is on the, is it runs this route at seven route, seven yards instead of eight, we don't have a turnover here or something like that. So um, I, I do think there is a culture of patience in Green Bay, which you're right, probably starts from the fact that they don't have a traditional ownership structure. Absolutely. All right, let's take a quick break. When we come back, I want to run through a bunch of other storylines to note as we get deeper and deeper into training camp right after this. 
All right, we're back. Jory, I have a few storylines that have just been percolating, percolating in the back of my brain. Let's get into them here. First of all, um, again, this is like stuff that we heard or saw in mini camp that we're wondering if it becomes a train, a true tea leaf in training camp. First of all, this quote from Jalen Hurts, I found so fascinating where he essentially said like 95% of the offense being installed is new. Um, this was the full quote from Jalen Hurts. You get to a point where you feel I'm going to be comfortable with this. I like this. That time comes when you rep it. But right now, it's been a lot of new inventory in the majority of it, probably 95% of it being new. And so it's just been that process. And it's been a fun process because you get to see what works for other people. Jory, I, again, I thought this was interesting because like 95% of the offense being new is a, is a rather extreme thing. Now, Nick Sirianni kind of tried to walk that back a little bit. You mentioned earlier when we were talking about Brian Johnson, like, how much of that was really Brian Johnson's offense? It's been a hyper specific offense that Eagles that the Eagles have run with Jalen Hurts under center. So I don't know. The ninety five percent quote caught my eye. Okay, you're gonna get cynical, Jory, on this one. Get ready for it. Incredible, good. <laughs> you have so many guys come from college to the NFL, much less another NFL team to another NFL team, and certainly much less the same NFL team with the same cast basically around it that a different coordinator and be like, football is football. It's just terminology. Do I think that Jalen Hurts has 95% new terminology? That's possible. Do I think that Jalen Hurts has 95% new game? What sport is he playing, if so? Because it's not professional <laughs> American football, let me tell you. I think that Kellen Moore probably has different philosophies. And if anything, it might just feel so new because Jalen Hurts is someone who basically didn't have any stability for so many years. It was something like, seven play callers in eight years and he just kept going from play caller to play caller to play caller which he's kind of doing now and so honestly if anything like he's seen so much over the course that I'm surprised he views this as such a change given how much change he's already gone through from high school to college to the NFL levels I am fascinated to see what Kellen Moore does with him though because Kellen Moore is going from Dak Prescott to Justin Herbert to Jalen Hurts who I think I mean, Justin and Jalen are such different players that he's going to have back-to-back in consecutive years. I also think Dak handles the game very differently in terms of, again, we were talking about what he does at the line of scrimmage. Not that the other guys aren't capable of it. That's just not necessarily what they do. Jalen's a lot more of a run threat, and particularly with that tush push than what Justin does. I, I also, what I think might be the answer here, I think we cannot underestimate the loss of Jason Kelsey this year because I was talking to Josh Myers, the Green Bay Center, about this. And when I was starting out in this league, 2016, Dak Prescott's rookie year, Travis Frederick, perennial all-pro was his center. And Travis just helped that transition so much because the center can really take a ton off the quarterback's plate. Okay, well, then Travis retires, and it's like, yeah, Tyler Biotis wasn't a bad player, but he was never going to be able to do what Travis had done after all of those years. Jalen Hurts might be having to take on a lot more of the calls of the line of scrimmage, a lot more of the managing and protections, a lot more of the play calls because Jason Kelsey isn't there. I don't know that. I haven't visited Philly, but I think that that could be a really interesting answer why. Well, on on that note, I saw this tweet from Shiel Kapadia of The Ringer, who you know has also covers, covers the Eagles. Um, he said, went to Eagles practice today, thought Jalen Hurts was impressive, and noted there's much more on his plate. Protections without Kelsey, shifts, most motion. He said he just threw the ball pretty accurately today. But I think that set that first point there about much more on his plate is exactly what we're talking about. And this is what caught my eye about the 95% quote, because when I watch Kellen Moore's offense and when I watch what the Eagles have been doing, yeah, one of those puts a lot more on the quarterback's plate than the other. <laughs> and and I think the fact that he is Jalen Hurts is now having to do that without Jason Kelsey. I do think it's like and I've been thinking about this all offseason that it's a bit of like an inflection point season for Jalen Hurts. Mm. Not that like, oh, he's not going to be the quarterback or this is a referendum on how good he is or whatever. But I just think he's going to have to do a lot more like be kind of the the he's going to bear the biggest burden on the team, I think, more so than he has previously. And like how he responds to that, I think, is going to be a super fascinating storyline to track. And, you know, there's always this temptation, Jory. Um, in the fantasy space with Kellen Moore's offense and and like the natural contrarian in me always kind of wants to push back on this because again if you look at Kellen Moore's offense from a on paper perspective they run a lot of plays they pass the ball a lot and and Kellen especially last year even in a year with the Chargers did a lot of really good things that we like you know motion the motion at the snap all of that stuff but 
you know, so there's a temptation in the fantasy space to be like, oh, this is an offense we want to invest in. And like, let's nuke up projections because of all of this, you know, for all these players. I think that could very well be true because there's a lot of really damn good players in Philadelphia. But I also just wonder, because I, I think that the, the big transition here is also not being thought about. And could this be an offense that maybe by the end of the season, if Hertz is up to the task, which why can't he be? I don't, I don't know. Maybe he really is burning things down. You know, he's, he's lighting the league on fire and, and AJ Brown's like pacing for a 1900 yard season. That is possible, but it could also be a, a team that kind of takes a little bit to get ramped up here because of how big the transition is. Yeah, it's a fascinating professional moment for Kellen Moore, too, because Kellen became the offensive coordinator when Dak had already had some of that responsibility on his plate. He went to the Chargers after Justin Herbert. From what I understand, I know less about that than Dak had also already been responsible for a lot of these things. I wonder if it's in the best interest for Jalen to be responsible for this, not because I think he's not capable of it. Smart guy, athletic, knows football well. I'm not questioning that. But when you think about what he does with the mobility and his dual threat capabilities, do you lose some of that if he's having to think at a, at a higher level? Like I'm thinking about the defensive equivalent of, hey, let's just have guys attack and not play a two-gap defensive front, et cetera, et cetera, because we don't want them to have to think. Well, if you make Jalen do the equivalent of that two-gapping, do you not get him to attack as quickly mm -hmm. and as effectively as he was before? That's a great question, and I think that it comes back to that Rodgers quote that you were saying earlier where guys are – you know, guys aren't playing quarterback as much um, like they're or they're they're passers, but they're not quarterbacks. Right. right. I, I think that's that's what Jalen Hurts has been so far. And can he be more? I think he's a tough guy to bet against based on just his history. Uh, but I do think that we are maybe not like just you know, the fantasy dorks. Maybe those of us on this side of it maybe are not taking into account how big of a transition is going to take place here. And look, again, there's there's volatility there. Frank Frank Schwab came on the show and said it best that this could be a team that wins the Super Bowl or it could be a team that like fires their coach by Halloween. I do think that's possible with this Eagles team and, yeah. and the offense sort of kind of uh, perfectly encapsulates that. OK, Jory, I've got to talk about Rashad Bateman and drum beats. Okay? Yeah, you do. You, you <laughs> care a lot about this. Please, it's going to be okay, Matt. We're going to get through please, this. Please do not make fun of me, Jory. Number one, I'm I'm sensitive. No, no. We are <laughs> and, uh, here to support. And number two, this is, this, this is my life, okay? I'm, I'm being obsessed about strange receivers. Like this, this is a, you know, my business partner, James Coe last year at Reception Perception on behind my back on a podcast said, Matt Harmon has a weird affinity for Nico Collins. Uh, that's what he, that's what he called it. A weird affinity, Jory. Um, number one, somebody pointed out, isn't that the whole, that's the whole bit. That's, that's your whole thing. Weird affinity for wide receivers. Yeah. Also number two, Nico Collins ended up having a great season. So shut up, James. Uh, number two. Okay, anyways, back back on track here. Um, Rashad Bateman. I we do. Have, I have a weird affinity for Rashad Bateman. So I'm going to read off just some quotes here. Uh, again, this all comes from Coach Speak Index on Twitter. February second in the postseason, John Harbaugh says this about Rashad Bateman. Rashad Bateman has a great future. He's going to be starting, playing a lot of snaps next year. Said Bateman has. He's, he's a great, great route runner. February 27th at the combine, John Harbaugh. On which player he expects to make a big leap in 2024. I think Rashad Bateman's going to take a big step. The ball's going to get to him a lot more next year. May 23 at OTAs, Ravens offensive coordinator Todd Monken says, I expect a tremendous year out of Rashad Bateman when talking about getting him more involved. July 22nd at training camp, John Harbaugh, head coach of the Baltimore Ravens, says on Rashad Bateman, quote, he's expected to be a top receiver in the league for us. That's what we're planning on. If you're a person that believes that actions speak louder than words, Jory Epstein, look at the actions of the Matt Baltimore Harmon. Ravens. <laughs> so formal. Look at the look at the actions of the Baltimore Ravens. They don't add any big name veteran receivers. They don't take a guy until the fourth round in Tez Walker, who's a bit of a developmental pick. And they gave Rashad Bateman like a little contract extension because his agent screwed up his fifth year option <laughs> last year. So I say all that to say, Jory, is this not a perfect example of drum beats, right? Like a steady progression throughout the course of the offseason. And, and am I asking you this because this fits my agenda as a guy who has been a longtime fan of Rashad Bateman and agrees like he is a really good route runner. He does execute his assignments. He just hasn't gotten a lot of targets. He could get a lot more targets this year. Jory, this is what goes on in my mind on a day to day basis. 
Okay, this reminds me of when I played volleyball in middle school and high school, and I would always get, like, the most improved player or, like, the best sportsmanship <laughs> one. And it was never the most valuable player. It was most about improved, to walk off and it was, like, <laughs> it was, like, this girl worked hard, and we want to let her know that we, we see it, we hear it, and we reflect it. Like, the, a best receiver in the league, like, is he even going to be the best receiver on this team? Is Zay Flowers no longer on the Ravens? Did I miss something? Like, I don't want to curb this. But And again, I am guilty of this too because I just told you all about how A.J. Dillon is going to light up your Packers feed this year and it might be the same thing. I think coaches have their training camp pets. I think John Harbaugh believes this, but I think there's like an element of this of like he wants to like will it to be true. Mm. I think there's an element that he wants to inspire Rashad Bateman to make it true. And then he probably also looks good. I also was having a conversation with someone at Bears practice today. Um, and we were talking just about like quarterbacks that look really good in practice and how I've been around some quarterbacks who just like look so below average in practice and then crush it on game day. And then quarterbacks who look so athletic and like they're lighting your hair on fire in practice and then struggle on game day. And so Rashad Bateman clearly seems to be winning practice. He seems to be winning, what is it, July? Um, I don't know. We'll see about September and October. I don't want I don't want to crush your soul, Matt. I don't. Well, you basically said Rashad Bateman is the participation trophy of wide receivers. So you the have the most improved you, trophy and the participation trophy are not the same. One of them is for top effort, like not just participating. He has effort here. Yeah, well, he's listen, working. That, yeah, he's working at it. And and the only again, I just don't the, know what the results are going to be. I think it's a little soon to get too excited. Definitely don't know what the results but are like going to be. But like you said about your fantasy audience, I will be here for you, Matt, no matter what happens <laughs> with Rashad Bateman. <laughs> Thank you. Um, hopefully, you're not the only one uh, because these these are also quotes that have been sent to me. It. All yeah, because I'm going to need it. The the reason I'm still like dying on the Rashad Bateman Hill is that I do think, unlike yeah, the typical practice like rando who pops up or anything like that. I think the context of this guy's career, and this is kind of what I, on a serious note, wanted to ask you about, is like the idea of the reclamation project mm. player and and how teams handle this because this is a player they took in the first round and when he's been on the field and again like watching him play charting him for reception perception and and I this is why I think the team believes this stuff too like he is a guy that plays really well he does get separation he just has had horrible injury luck right and he even said after last season was over he's like I didn't even think I was going to play last season because he was coming back from this foot injury so Yes, typically, like we see a guy who has not been productive through his first three seasons in the league, pl quote, played a full season or close to a full season last year. And it's like, oh, yeah, he had 300 yards or something like who cares? Move on. Um, but I do think the context of this individual situation and the fact that the team does seem so willing to give him this benefit of the doubt and, and be that kind of reclamation project. I don't know. I'm I'm just fascinated if like this is a normal thing or or if it's something we can really count. Can we count on it? No, Jory, we cannot count on it. But it's something that I am at least willing to keep the candle lit for. Yeah, I will say I think I'm a little biased based off my experience being around a couple players in my career in similar situations who everyone wanted to come back. And they just didn't make it to where they thought, especially after an injury. I will ask you. The Gallup you, example, by the way, like we talked about him up the top. He was he's somebody that this does come to mind. I said with we're that, not naming names. I'm name. I'm naming <laughs> names without you. I, you're not naming names. I'm you're I'm re I'm recklessly speculating, Jory, as somebody who just sits at this desk all day. Um, but I think Gallup was a guy who had that torn ACL and he just never regained form. And, you know, was it a confidence issue? Was it a health issue? I don't know. The fact that that is why you like you saying the the Ravens almost like willing this to believe, like putting that confidence in, I do think is an Which interesting matters, I will say. I do yes. think confidence is a big variable. And again, now that we've named names, I will withhold my further uh speculative. Again, you didn't name any results. names. I am I am <laughs> recklessly speculating as a as a okay. non-insider. Let's just say I agree with a lot of what you're saying, and I think that your theories have credence. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> well, yeah, I I think just I, I'm living on both sides here because part of me, um, like we, I never want to. You're right. I hope Rashad Bateman crushes it this year. Yeah, I mean, you, you and you and me both. Okay. <laughs> um, I know I don't want to spend us too long on any more of these subjects, but I do really quickly want to hit on the Cleveland Browns before we talk about wide receivers and take another quick break here. Um, Cleveland Browns, interesting stuff just out of their camp. One back in OTAs and mini camp. Uh, Deshaun Watson seemingly was on a bit of a load management program for part of OTAs uh, in minicamp. He's definitely somebody to monitor, like how much ramp up does he have in training camp? Like, is he a full go? Is he fully throwing every every 
practice? Like, what's the sort of practice schedule with him? I think it's important to monitor. But also, we did get some resolution to Amari Cooper's contract. Uh, the Cleveland Browns and Amari Cooper did not come to an agreement on a contract extension, but he did get a raise for the final year of his deal and a guarantee after holding out of mini camp. Cooper and the Browns agreed to a restructure of the final year of his five year, $100 million deal to guarantee the $20 million remaining on the contract and add an additional $5, mi- $5 million to his salary. Um, I thought that was interesting because this was kind of a quiet situation, uh, Jory. And I know that you covered Amari Cooper when he was with the Cowboys. I maintain that this guy has played the best football of his career the last two years with the Cleveland Browns. And, you know, there's a lot of factors to it. Maybe, like, a little bit of extra motivation. I also just think he's been playing in a good system for his uh, skill set. But this is a pretty important thing to happen. Um, so this, in conjunction with with Watson and sort of monitoring his uh, participation in camp, I think will be critical to these two guys who both could be values in fantasy. And honestly, like the entire Browns offense is interesting with their new hire of offensive coordinator, Ken Dorsey. OK, I'm not trying to annoyingly like throw facts at you that you might not know again. But and I don't know this by heart. I have it in front of me. How many times do you think Amari Cooper has hit a thousand yards in a season? Three. Seven. Seven. I don't know why Seven. I said three. That how how many? Guess. It's okay. How? No, because you, you can hit 800, 900. How many touchdowns do you think the man has in his career receiving touchdowns? Like total? Yeah. I don't know. 45. 60. I was 60. thinking about all this recently because we kind of forget like Amari Cooper has been in this league for 10 years I and know. he's still pretty much doing what he did when he got here and in some ways looks better. I'm not saying that he is in the same physical shape as he was in 2015 and he and I are three weeks apart. We both turned 30 recently. Like I understand the aging. My knees are feeling it. My foot is feeling it. All of these things. <laughs> that said, it is pretty insane. Like because he doesn't have the same diva receiver personality. I don't. I don't think we realized it. And then I was working with Amari on a story this summer about a chess mm. tournament he created in his weekly chess tournament. So I like go to look at these stats, and I'm like, this is ridiculous. Like, and because he's been good in like different areas. Like if he had done seven a thousand yard seasons for the Cowboys, he'd be setting franchise records. But he's going to different franchises. This is a guy who's still playing. And again, I don't want to jinx it. I don't want him to have an injury sure. and like knock on the wood at Hallis Hall here to the Chicago Bears headquarters. But it's pretty remarkable that last in two seasons. His ninth and tenth year in the league with his third franchise. And by the way, last year, four different quarterbacks, the majority of whom were not named Deshaun Watson, who was making a gazillion guaranteed dollars to be his quarterback. He had 1160 yards and nine touchdowns and then 1250 and five. Like that is just so productive. And so I think that when you give him this money, like on one hand, you have every receiver wanting, like the Vikings just screwed everyone in the receiver market and the quarterbacks, like, I don't know how it's going to blow up, especially if there's any sort of setback from the Sunday ticket litigation. Mm. But Amari is playing like a top receiver. I agree. And the, I think the reason that I undershot the thousand yard season uh, thought was because I think Amari Cooper has not had like a cons- – at the end of year production has been consistent, but I don't think the journey to get to that production has been very consistent. He's been a kind of an up and down player at different points in his career. Um, but that's not been the case really. And like, screw the production for a second. <laughs> that has not been the case in Cleveland because yeah. I think Cleveland, like when I watch it, when I chart his game, his game film from all the way back, like he's, he's a guy I definitely have every season on because he's been in the league. Like you said, 10 years, which is about the amount of time I've been charting so crazy. wide receivers. Yeah, it is crazy. I mean, my God. What, what is going on here? But yeah, like he is a guy that from the Raiders days through the Cowboys days, I think was a very up and down volatile player. You know, this was always yes. a conversation with him in fantasy. He was like, why is he such an up and down producer? I was thinking because he's he's an up and down player. But in Cleveland, these last two years, when I watched that film, I chart that film. It's been his best two seasons like with a bullet. And I feel very mm. confident saying that because not only has he played extremely well from a consistent route by route basis. He's also been playing like big boy X receiver uh, as the on the line of scrimmage player. A lot more has been put on his plate. And I think interestingly, he has responded to that uh, in a very in a way that you might not expect from a receiver who is volatile in these different ways prior. So you're right that like he has been just I think it's been underrated how good he's been in Cleveland. He's wide receiver 26 right now in fantasy. And I could easily see if mm. a big if is, if is the whole Watson thing. Right. But even even if Watson's like a mid-level quarterback, he can still probably outkick that because they have other interesting names on this depth chart. But there's a pretty clear drop off from Cooper to everybody else. 
Yeah. And I'm not saying that Amari is going to be there for you every week. Like, he is always liable for that, like, random two catches on five targets for 37 yards a week. And look, quite frankly, his recent playoff games have not been what he or anyone else around him would have wanted either. Mm. But I do think over the course of a season, it's just pretty remarkable what he's been able to do and how even when he has those down times, he'll come up. And when he played for the Cowboys, there was a lot made of his home versus road splits, which a lot of people thought was not simply a home versus road, but also a turf versus grass inside mm. versus elements. And so the fact that he's done what he's done in Cleveland – on the grass, on the elements, when he doesn't have that sort of security and safety of like controlled climbing in AT and T Stadium, I think is also something that maybe we hadn't seen from him in the previous years. Yeah, hey, maybe the guy just likes sleeping in his own bed or in the in the same in the same. <laughs> I mean, zip I feel code. that. I'm not doing it for the next three weeks, but I feel that. Oh man, I, if I was you, I would be so sad. <laughs> Grateful for the opportunity, but it is like every time I like bring the the suitcase into the hotel, and I'm like. All right, let's bring that back out tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, well, it's a privilege. It's a privilege Absolutely. to serve. It's a privilege to serve the big Y. That's for sure. So we are glad <laughs> to do it. Okay, let's take another quick break. When we come back, I want to talk a few wide receiver contract situations and uh, a few Dallas thoughts, Jory. It'd be a mistake to have you on the show and not get a few Cowboys things in here right after this. All right, Jory, you mentioned it. Wide receiver contracts. It's all the rage these days. Um, Brandon Ayuk. T. Higgins, Jamar Chase, Cortland Sutton was also on this list about like guys who wanted a new contract, but the Broncos gave him kind of a revised deal this morning. Um, C.D. Lamb and Dallas is also in this group. Just, I don't know, throw anything out. Like I throw all those names out there to you. You tell me which one you find interesting, um, kind of setting C.D. to a side because I want to have a more extensive Cowboys conversation in a second. Okay, I'll give you two interesting things to me. The first is I wonder – what would happen if one of these guys is like, I'll take, what is it, $32 million instead of the 40-something they want? Because I think back to when Ezekiel Elliott, let's see, it was, it was Zeke, Jalen Smith, and Dak and Amari, like all up for contract mm -hmm. extensions with Dallas. And Jalen was not the most deserving of a contract. He was not there. He was not back from his injury, even though I really respect his road back. But he got that money basically because the Cowboys wanted to show someone like, hey, if you take not even a full hometown discount, but just like an above average rather than a super high deal, we'll give you the money. It would be interesting to see. And, I, and I'm not saying that these guys owe it to the teams to do it. I'm not sure. trying to like give away their leverage. But I do think it would be interesting because I think a lot of these teams aren't saying we don't want to pay you. They're saying we don't know what to do because the Vikings, who don't have to pay a quarterback top money – just pay this receiver insane money. And now the receivers are like, well, then we're worth that. And the teams are like, uh, quarterback contract, what are we supposed to do over here? So I think there's that's interesting. The other thing I'll say is the whole like IU cold out situation. I was talking to some people when all this became public and I'm like, is it just me or do the Niners have more people hold out every year than like every other team combined? <laughs> yeah. And an executive but on I mean, another Trent team. Trent Williams is also holding out right now. <laughs> and then Nick Bosa was, I mean, like what's Brock Purdy going to do next year? I'm not saying he is. I'm just saying like every year it's like, oh yeah, like would it even be training camp if we if we didn't have one to three 49ers holding out? And, oh, by the way, I don't know how much it hurts them because I think they were just in the Super Bowl. Um, I will say, though, that when I, I told an executive that, they were like, yeah, when you have that many talented players, they can't all get paid. And they know how many talented players need to get paid over there. So, like, it's such a, as I think Albert Breer from Sports Illustrated put over there, uh, a champagne problem. And so I think that that one interests me just because, like <laughs> – I'm not saying he shouldn't hold out, and I do agree with agents generally that that is a leverage point. I agree with Jordan Love's agents that not practicing is one of the few leverage points they have in a league where teams have totally skewed leverage with all of the franchise tag control. I just don't know that San Francisco holdouts – should be taken seriously either on the player side or the front office side because they always get the deal done by the season. But the guys like don't come to training camp and it's like, you know, this is going to happen. Neither of you really changed anything. Like just get it done and go practice. Right. You're right. Just get it done. That's the thing. And um, it, it, it has been weird, right? Like even Debo Samuel basically like followed the exact same plot a couple of right. years ago where I, I remember there was we do even, this every year right he like requests a trade we've and then seen this episode before we have there there was like a, a scene with him in like a club or something like that and it was a big sign like Debo's coming back and the camera pans to him and he goes like no I'm not like he does like the over the throat image like no um and sure enough Training camp comes around, pen to paper, he's there, you know, being a productive player for the team, which is how I think the IU situation probably ends up going. Although the fact that Trent Williams is now also wanting a contract extension in in conjunction with this 
It's just like another variable, but it is totally champagne problems. Like, yeah, you have a lot of good players. Figure it out. And the problem here, problem, is that they're going to pay Brock Purdy next year unless something goes terribly wrong. Minnesota could pay Justin Jefferson because they are not paying a, re- a quarterback anytime soon. Sam Darnold is making, what, $10 million this year? And then they hope that J.J. McCarthy can be their rookie contract guy. And that's a huge uh, just like market inefficiency to exploit in the NFL. The Niners have to save this money for Brock. They can't give it to everybody else and still have Brock. You sound a lot like uh, Jerry and Stephen Jones today. I know. Like, I don't <laughs> want to. I don't want to. Which, by the way, no. Then I'm just going to take us into the Cowboys conversation right yes. now, Matt. Because that was what I was going to do, but you're a better host than me. I, I, I don't want to. I don't want to sound like Jerry and Stephen Jones because I think that this is what I feel about the 49ers. Because every year we see them hold out, we see them get the deal done. They just do it late. For the Cowboys, it's like. They're not only going to pay, they're going to pay top dollar. Like the Niners mm-hmm. might still negotiate over the next few weeks. Like the Cowboys paid Zeke a gazillion dollars when no one was paying running backs. So why are you not just getting CD in the building? Because the Cowboys, like, I actually think the Niners, I know I said they're going to pay them, but I don't think they're going to pay them more than they're willing to pay them because I think they are a more disciplined front office who's going to do it. Jerry's too sentimental to be disciplined like that. And so he's going to pay CD. He's not going to let him walk out the door. And now it's like, just pay him now. And oh, by the way, if you pay him now, then you can tell David Mulligetta and Micah Parsons' agent that, well, you don't have the money because you paid CD. Like, just be done with this part of the equation. They, they just wait to pay every single person. And I think that that is so unhelpful. Yeah. I mean, how about not even just pay him now? How about pay him like five months ago? You know, uh, just get like, if you get ahead of this stuff, or even two years ago, like what? Why not just have paid him before last season? You know that that's a whole other thing. Like literally waiting until the last minute with multiple players does get you into this situation. Um, so I do want to talk about some of these like contracts and 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 Cowboys and all that stuff. But before that, I just wanted to kind of throw this at you, Jory, because we taped the first episode of Football Three Hundred One, new podcast. If you haven't listened to it already, Heck yeah, it's with me, so Charles excited. McDonald, Nate Tice. I am very excited. Literal first episode dream was great. team. I mean. People are saying it. Um, you said I it, am me. among the people saying it. <laughs> so we projected out our top 10 offenses in 2024, and none of us had the Cowboys in the top 10. Uh, some people on Cowboys Twitter were pissed about it. Got a lot of comments and feedback on that yesterday, which I thought was fascinating because, yes, as many Cowboys fans pointed out, the Cowboys were like, you know, top four in points per game the last three years. By the way, let's remember the exercise was ranking the top 10 offenses of this year, not last year. And if I'm not mistaken, Joy, has everybody not been pointing out all offseason that this team, you know, didn't certainly didn't get better, but may have gotten actively worse on offense this year? Like, is it so outrageous to think that the Cowboys could take a step back offensively? I don't think it's outrageous to think that. I think that they lost their center in Tyler Biotish. They lost their left tackle in Tyron Smith. Historically, when Dallas's offensive line has not been very solid, they have not been able to do what they needed to do as an offense. Also, like, who are you afraid of in the running game? Um, I mean, I still think that, like, Dak and their passing game have a lot of options. If anything, I would be more willing to say that I think the Cowboys will be a top 10 offense than I will that they will be a top 10 team in terms of win records Mm. because I think they're very good at inflating the score, particularly against NFC East teams and other teams who are probably not going to make the playoffs. So that, to me, might be what gets them statistically in top 10 offense. But they had years under Kellen Moore where they were like top offense but not getting where they wanted to go in the playoffs. Um, I do think, though, that from the run game and the offensive line game, I mean, the run game and the run defense, both sides, I think there's a lot of reasons to be concerned for Dallas. So I totally understand where you're coming from. Yeah. And we were ranking it based off like DVOA, you know, the old football yeah. outsider stats now of FTN, not number one, not like yards and points and stuff like that. Cause yeah, that stuff can be inflated. I mean, and you can even inflate DVOA. Of course, they like adjust for opponents, which does help. But yeah, it, it's almost kind of akin to what we said about the Dolphins and. We were just, we did just kind of met, like passing mention the Dolphins. It's like, yeah, super bo- like great offense, one of the most creative in the league, but it's almost boring to talk about because it's just like, hey, do it when it's cold outside, as Charles said. Um, yeah. and, and with Dallas, it's kind of similar. Like, great, you put up 45 points against the, the Giants who are going nowhere. Like, do it against a real team. So I don't know. I mean, look, from a personnel perspective, this is, this is not a, not a good group of skill position players. I mean, you got producer Colin sending me like Jalen Tolbert cope 
tweets every other every other day. I mean, it's outrageous what's going on here. So um, I don't know. I think that's interesting just in the background of everything else that's going on with Dallas, Jory. So um, I just want to have a play a quick little Cowboys game here before I get you out of here. Simple little racing game. I'm going to give you a name and you tell me how close you think they are to a deal. Uh, we're going to do four, the four guys that they, you know, are basically having to work on extensions with right now, which Dak Prescott, CeeDee Lamb, Micah Parsons, and I'm going to throw Mike McCarthy in the mix too. Uh, okay. So first of all, Dak Prescott, first lap, second lap, or final lap? I'll say second lap. I think first of all, when you have a quarterback who has already negotiated a contract with this specific team, negotiate an extension, you're not on the first lap. You understand where you're coming from. He hasn't switched agents since that last deal. He has showed what he's capable of. He's also showed what he hasn't yet done in the playoffs. So I don't think they're final. I would be very surprised if they get a deal done before this season. I just don't think it's how the Cowboys operate. And I think they are being very intentional about letting a lot of guys prove it this year. Um, but it's not it's not first lap. Like they know what generally they're gonna need to do. And the question is just do they do it now or do they do it in a year? Because the price will be different. CD Lamb, first lap, second lap, final lap. I'll say final lap because I think he'll be the first one that gets done. I think he's going to need to get done this year if they want him to play. And I do think they want him to play, going back to what you just said about the uh the dearth of skill position players that really scare you on the Dallas offense and CDs are obviously at the top. The question is, how quickly are they running that final lap? Because I think since they're on the final lap, if they want it done before they get the pads on, they can. I don't think that they're going to do that. I think they're going to overpay him in a month. They need to hit that little Mario Kart yeah. bucket thing and get one of them mushrooms and they need to speed this thing yeah, along Yeah, if you could here. hand that mushroom, although you got to be careful what mushroom you're handing, Jerry, but... <laughs> You're not wrong about that. Um, by the way, I don't know if you I, just my take on this. I don't know if you can overpay CD Lamb. Like he's, I, I get that he's not Justin Jefferson, but do you want Dak on the team next year with him? I would, I would rather have CD Lamb and like start over at quarterback than okay. like than have Dak Prescott and not have CD Lamb. That's fair. I, that's. That's just like my personal opinion. No, I opinion think that's here. an understandable take. I think it's not that you're overpaying CD relative to what he can do. It's that you are screwed to keep your quarterback if you pay anyone like the Vikings who don't need to pay a quarterback pay their receiver. Yeah, that's a that's a fair point. Um, if you're starting over a quarterback, I want number 88 there running slant routes better than anybody else in the business. And my last thing is you're overpaying him because if you paid him six months ago, it would yeah. have cost you less. So you're overpaying him because you chose not to listen to the market, which has not changed its trajectory. Today's price is not yesterday's price, as they say. Okay, Final player here, Micah Parsons, first lap, second lap, final lap. I'll say first lap. I think that they're not going to do Micah now before they get Dak and CD figured yes. out. Whether or not they sign them, I think they are going to make those decisions before they make the Micah decision. He also, what, three years in, and then you have the year four, and then you have the fifth year option, and then you have two franchise tags. I do believe that because he's a David Mulligata player, he will use the leverage he has. I also think that that is much more about holding out. Like, he can't go anywhere for like four years. Yeah, they're barely out of the gates on that one, much less uh, like halfway through the first lap. Okay, final one, Mike McCarthy, first lap, second lap, final lap. Or are they still just, they even, they're not even brought the car out. I was going to say that was going to be my answer. I don't think they've started the race. Now, look, do they understand the race that they need to run if they want to get there? Yes. These guys have been together for five years now. They understand what they're working with. I think they want him to prove it. I think that Jerry hired him and said, look, this is a guy who won a Super Bowl there. I was just in Green Bay. I drove right past the Mike McCarthy way sign. And that's what Jerry brought him to Dallas or to Frisco, Texas for. That's not what he's done. They didn't bring him to lead a really productive offense because they had that before he got there. They brought him to take them ideally to the Super Bowl, but at the very least to the NFC Championship game. And so I think if Jerry's honest with himself, that should be the threshold for Mike McCarthy this year. But we say that every year. And then he's still there. So I don't think we should bank on Jerry being honest with himself about why he brought in Mike. I am just very fascinated with this offense, not because I ranked them outside of the top 10, um, but just like we're, we kind of have this morose sort of view of the team at this point. And at the same time, though, like none of that has really trickled into the top players in terms of how we view them for fantasy. Right. But I, I wonder if that is the case. Like, can CeeDee Lamb repeat the year that he had last year if the team takes a step back? I don't I don't think so. We think about it like, oh, yeah, the, maybe the team's not as good. They're going to be throwing the ball a lot more. You want to be in efficient, advantageous situations with your top receiver talent. And I, I just wonder if that's going to be the case. 
Yeah. No, I think it's a great question. The other thing I want to ask you is, this is my selfish part speaking. I loved working with Zach Prescott. I live in New York now. Is there any chance the Giants get Dak next year? I know that he was, I think, talking today and mentioned all these great quarterbacks and saying how, hey, look, even the Peyton Mannings of them went to another team at the end of their career. I want to know from you, one, is there any chance you think the Giants get Dak? And two, is there any chance that they will be, like, set up for Dak to succeed there? Like, you'll have neighbors, but will you have an Mm. offensive line? Like, what are our options here? I mean, I think that's one of the few places. Look, the best laid plans go to hell pretty quickly in the NFL. And, like, we're looking at it now. Like, yeah, this team looks set up. This team looks set up. Um, But we could feel very differently about a variety of these quarterbacks. Like, you know, the Rams dumped Matthews or dumped Jared Goff to get Matthew Stafford at the beginning of that season. I don't know that anybody felt like Jared Goff was on the hot seat. Right. But by the end of the right. year, Sean McVay. So just so over the Jared Goff experience, he's got to do something. He ends up. I mean, getting the Matthew Giants Stafford. have made pretty clear on hard knocks. They are not committed to Daniel Jones. And I was going to say and that, that situation is not what's happening in New York where it's the other way around. But I just wonder if there's a team like that does seem to have a quarterback firmly entrenched that has an opening. But yeah, they're one that certainly seems to have an opening that I think he would, Dak Prescott would probably want to go to. It's a big market. I think Brian Dayball is still a good offensive coach. I think Mike Kafka has shown positive time signs as the um, OC. But at the same time, are those guys going to be the ones making the decision if the Giants had of a bottom out year where they're getting rid of their quarterback and all of that stuff? Those are the things that are just unknowable. Okay, so my last absurd question of the day for you, is it more likely that Dak wins the Super Bowl as quarterback of the Giants or that Rashad Bateman leads the league in receiving yards this year. Oh, well, it's definitely more likely that Rashad Bateman leads the league in receiving yards. Did you, do I need to read the quotes to you again, Jory? <laughs> I mean, I hear he's one of the best receivers in the league. A best receiver in the league. Not the, but A. Okay, that's uh, all. John Done. Harbaugh, who apparently you just think is full of full of. Uh, John Harbaugh said he's expected to be a top receiver in the league for us. That's what we're planning on. Not only is it on the outline, Joy, I also have it tattooed here on my forearm. Right. Uh, July 22nd at Coach Speak Index. Gosh. Right next the to the route chart. Here. We have yeah. the receipts. We, we have the receipts. No, uh, Jory, this has been fantastic. Even if you bullied me about Rashad Bateman, which you know what? I'm going to give you credit for Jory. Um, <laughs> Because most people, like, when they're having wide receiver conversations with me, they just, like, agree with me and, like, oh, you, you must know more than me. Um, you come on the – people come on the podcast and they're, like, they don't want to disagree with me about the position I spend so much time on. And, and you're not even necessarily disagreeing with me, but you're making fun of me, which is even better, <laughs> honestly. So I'm giving you credit for being a great guest on the show uh, wow. and, and making Honored. fun of me m- making fun of me about wide receivers, which nobody else is brave enough to do. Well, hopefully we'll have the opportunity to come back and I can make fun of you again. I'll also note to the listeners that I was texting yesterday being like, I was reading this athletic article about this and this receiver and guess who they quoted. And you're like, oh, who? I don't think I've seen that article yet. And I was like, (laughs) Matt Harmon of Reception Perception. And you're like, oh, I didn't expect it to be me. So I am both like behind the scenes, your biggest fan and sending you like, look, I know him. And he was quoted in the athletic article. Read your Yahoo articles. Don't just read the athletic articles, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, sometimes you just got to make sure we keep you honest. A hundred percent. That's what a real friend does. Uh, <laughs> you support you support your friends, but you also know when to bring your friends down. Um, Jory, you're a friend of the show. I appreciate you. Thank you so much for coming on, especially uh, I know it was a bit of a chaotic situation trying to get you in a good spot here at Hallis Hall. But tell the people what you're working on right now that they can check out during doing all these training camp visits. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Matt. And yes, I've got a couple pieces out of Green Bay where I was, including one on the Jordan Love contract situation and why they decided to anoint him as their franchise quarterback. Another one on Josh Jacobs. Now today I'll write about Jonathan Owen, Simone Biles' husband. I'll have Caleb Williams content and I will be all over the Midwest and then all over Southern California and then the Northeast before I one day sleep in my bed again. So follow along at Jory Epstein and make sure you listen to Football 301 because Matt and C-Mac and Nate are just going to crush it. Yes, absolutely. Definitely do all of that. And I personally will be reading the Caleb Williams Roma Dunze piece because for whatever you think I feel about Rashad Bateman, 5X that for how I feel about Roma Dunze. So, and okay, we're still sorry, bright I have to tell you one more story because 
every scout I talked to was obsessed with Roma Dunze. Every single one. Like, you never really have consensus from everyone. And yes, they liked him as a player, but just the person, they're like, this is who we need in our team building. And I like started off my interview with Roma Dunze by telling him how obsessed scouts are with him. And I think it was like probably not how I needed to start, especially because I wouldn't want someone telling that to me. But I was more, he's just like, and of course I should know that like he, who's like the sweetest guy and like so about everybody else was like, anything good I did in this interview credit my parents and my siblings was not going to want someone he literally said that at the end was not going to want someone being obsessed with him but yeah great dude great player and i'll be rooting for him regardless of what the bears do 100 percent same feel the same way uh yeah I'll, i've only ever heard good things uh about roma dunes and i expect to hear many more as the season rolls on um speaking of rolling on that is going to do it for us today and this concludes our off season pod schedule. Yeah, I know week one is still a long way away. We're not even to August yet, but forget it. The off season's over. Your outside time is over. Your time socializing is over. We are entering fantasy draft season. And next week, we're going to start that off with a banger. It's strategy week. Oh boy. Strategy week on the pod. And we're going to ramp up to three shows a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, up first mock draft. Mondays are back, but not in the way than it was during draft season, obviously. Uh, we're going to be diving into some of our fantasy mock drafts and the results of those, our biggest observations from a recent d- rookie dynasty, not a rookie dynasty draft, a full startup dynasty draft that we're going to do. And Nate Tice is going to join me for that podcast. How electric is that? What a great time to be alive. Until then, we're out. We're out.